Uh, after that last discussion, I am glad that I'm introducing you to a bunch of problem solvers because that last conversation, which I've had many times, just always kind of freaks me out a little bit. I feel like we're not completely in control. So this discussion has been going on for a long time. We've had it several times at the um, IGF, and we've always uh, gone back and forth with uh, the two different you know, levels of the conversation. One is the consumer level, because there's a lot of us that are sitting probably in rooms right now with a lot of devices. But with the advent of 5G and next generation networks, we're really seeing a huge change in how the internet of things is, is being handled at the industrial and the commercial and the, um, the, you know, the more than the consumer level, which is really where we're gonna focus today. So welcome to the road to IoT security panel. Uh, this really, the idea of IoT security took off after the Dyn attack in 2016, where a series of distributed denial of service attacks were using uh, uh, devices to create a bot network. And I realize this is a pretty sophisticated audience on this, so a lot of you will understand what happened there, but it brought forward an international dialogue about security flaws in the internet of things. And while years ago, machine-based connections were really in networks and used by internal corporates, uh, we now have seen the advent of the internet of everything connection. And we realize that we need to be more disciplined about every part of the ecosystem. So there's an entire ecosystem that calls on the manufacturers at the very beginning, like Intel, who we'll hear from today, to work with the manufacturers of devices, both big and small, to adhere to agreed to policies and principles for the security by design. This means promoting security that is interoperable, scalable, measurable, and, and has a, a global application. Drafting these international standards and policy guidelines have created conversations that are both cross-industry, consensus-driven, and approaches that have brought together governments and industry, the engineers and the lawyers, as well as created public-private partnerships that are multi-sector and allow for widespread deployment across networks that allow for rapid growth of all these really complex networks working together. So I am going to um, ask each one of my panelists to talk for a couple minutes about their part of this ecosystem, and then I look forward to a really healthy discussion. Paul, I'm going to start with you and just a quick introduction. Paul Eisler is the Senior Director of Cybersecurity at U.S. Telecom. He's an attorney with more than a decade of experience in cyber policy, and he serves as a Secretariat of the Council to Secure the Digital Economy, which is an amazing read. They've done a very good job of getting a lot of this complicated stuff in a succinct document. So, Paul, tell us what you've been working on there and, and how this is important to your constituents at U.S. Telecom. Thanks, Shane. So if you spend enough time in Washington policy circles, you hear the term public-private partnership thrown around a lot. But today, what I'm hoping this panel illustrates is not only that tremendous progress is already being made towards securing the Internet of Things, but also that the collaboration, the genuine partnership between industry and government is a model that can be exported because it works and we can use it for future success. To that, to that end, uh, when you talk about why policymakers and why industry care so much about securing the Internet of Things. There is, of course, the DDoS attacks like the massive uh, attack on Dyn that you mentioned. There's also the propagation of many different types of malware, including ransomware, such as you've seen in the news, a lot of incidents surrounding uh, ransomware. And you've also seen the propagation of disinformation campaigns. There was this astounding study at Carnegie Mellon that found that during the height of COVID-19, somewhere between 45 and 60% of Twitter accounts discussing the pandemic were actually bots and not human beings. So for many policymakers, as you said, the big call to action was in 2016, when the now historic Mirai botnet attack on the DNS provider DIN took place. And it was in response to this event that the Council to Secure the Digital Economy was formed. The acronym we use for this is CSDE. The website is csde.org. Uh, in full disclosure, Mike Bergman and I were part of the secretariat and meets on the steering committee. Uh, this group is comprised of 15 global ICT leaders and it's co-managed by US Telecom in partnership with CTA. Uh, and the purpose of CSDE, it's to address problems that cannot be solved by individual companies or segments of the global ecosystem, because what we need is a holistic solution. What we need is cross-sector partnership and we need everybody to cooperate and do their part. So that's why we, we also have numerous uh, partners across the ecosystem that endorse individual projects. For example, the IoT security policy principles, which were published earlier this year, these were endorsed by a total of 27 and counting organizations 
across the United States, Japan, and Europe, and we're starting to engage stakeholders in Latin America as well, although those conversations are still in the early stages. Uh, we publish an annually updated, updated guide to fighting botnets, which has been cited consistently by U.S. government partners and stakeholders across the world. It was translated into Japanese. It was cited in publications of the Global Internet Governance Forum. However, when we originally published the guide, there was no, uh, uh, the original iteration of it, there was no technical standard for IoT. In fact, there wasn't even a published consensus baseline that industry had affirmatively said yes to at the time. So we saw this as an opportunity to contribute to NIST's efforts and demonstrate that the public-private partnership is more than a series of talking points. It's an operational reality. So in parallel with NIST's development of the core baseline on IoT, in 2019, CSDE brought together dozens of convening organizations. We're talking trade associations, we're talking standards development organizations, industry alliances, coalitions. And what we did is we leveraged the expertise of their hundreds of technical experts and ultimately formed the C2 consensus baseline. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, experts continued to continue virtually to update the document, resulting in CSD's publication of a supplement in 2021. So this is something that we're con we continue to improve and refine and update. The C2 consensus baseline, it maps to NIST 8259, uh, core baseline, and it provides a common set of security capabilities that importantly can be applied across all new IoT devices that connect to the internet. So, and there, there are now important technical standards that are being built to translate this into a language that can be implemented by engineers. So for example, we already have uh, ANSI uh, CTA 2088. And now that we have the, this guidance that is detailed enough for engineers to actually implement an IoT security uh, baseline, the next step is how do we build international consensus? Because ANSI, I mean, I can't, I can't overstate how big a deal it is that we have this, but they are ultimately an American organization. So, and there are other standard institutes in other parts of the world. So uh, we, are, we are now in the process of developing an international uh, consensus, and you'll hear more, I'm sure, from the other panelists about this who are, who are deep in the trenches and contributing to this important effort. And we also have multiple standards that have been or are currently being developed for different industry ver verticals. The, the, the high level takeaway from all of this work is that our goal is to raise expectations for security throughout the global marketplace because cybersecurity has no borders and the best solutions will be the international ones. Thank you, Paul, that was a great introduction. Adam, most priority thing I need you to do after I introduce you is explain to people what 8259A is, <laughs> which I'm looking at the, it, it, I know it's now in Portuguese and Spanish, so that's mas importante. Uh, so Adam Sedgwick is a senior information technology policy advisor at NIST, uh, where he works on uh, you know, standards as we're hearing about right now. And he, he's uh, been in a major advisory role at NIST leadership in cybersecurity, privacy, and the related technology issues, which uh, to me seems like most of what NIST should do. I'm sure there's other things they do, but when I think of NIST, those are all the things I think that NIST does. So as far as I'm concerned, Adam, you're in charge. So how's it going? You know, are your, your our government stalwart on this and what the hell is 8259A? Thanks, Shane. I, I had actually promised myself I wasn't going to speak with uh, this acronym and numbers, but um, you're, you're, you just you're, have to you're, because it's, someone's going to slide <laughs> in. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, uh, just to talk a little bit about, about what NIST does overall. And, um, you know, Shane mentioned a big part of the digital work, but um, we do quite a bit. Um, and our, our overall focus is all around measurement, which, which Shane also mentioned. Um, and um, we are a national laboratory. We are actually part of the government within the Commerce Department. Um, but being a non-regulatory agency actually has given us the, the freedom to collaborate with stakeholders on their same level, right? So um, there, are already sort, there are always discussions around sort of voluntary versus mandatory when it comes to cybersecurity. Our role is heavily geared towards the voluntary, um, and we think that's very uh, successful because it allows us to work with the greatest number of stakeholders possible. So it's not about, do I have to do this? Should I do this? Um, we, found, we find really our strength by working with people to do things that they want to do because it benefits them. Um, 
IoT is an interesting example of the, the type of work we do. Um, I think we grappled with it for a long time. We called it different things. We called it cyber physical systems, partially because I think if you were to put a, uh, a list of all the things that we do in cybersecurity and privacy on a dartboard and blindfold yourself and throw that dart, you would land upon something that has something to do with IoT, right? Our workforce and awareness work has a lot to do with IoT because that's how people are going to be interacting with the internet and have cybersecurity and privacy considerations. Our work in encryption will have to do with IoT because encryption has a, a lot of power demand. So we do a lot of work with, with uh, encryption and low power and constrained devices. Um, and a lot of the use cases are going to be really different, right? You're going to want to have different security capabilities if the IoT device is something that's helping you stay alive versus something that's just a node in a highway that's delivering some information back to the Department of Transportation periodically about the health of the highway. It's also important. It's just you might have different security and privacy considerations. Um, so the role with NIST in this space, it, 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 it's twofold. Um, in a lot of what we do in cybersecurity and privacy, we have this mission that goes back a long time in developing standards and guidelines for federal information systems. Um, so if you're Department of Transportation or you're the Morris K. Udall Scholarship Foundation, you need to use NIST standards and guidelines to help you leverage commercial off-the-shelf products. So that's to get us away from um, a system where we tell, the, uh, we tell technology providers exactly what they need to create for our limited use case um, instead of just trying to figure out how do we leverage innovation and what technology companies are already doing, how do we harness that to help uh, departments and agencies meet their business mission? So um, it was only very recently, for example, that the Department of Defense stopped having custom-built mobile phones, right? They realized, oh, we can just leverage what these organizations are doing and make sure that they're mindful of their security and we can leverage that for our own business purposes. Um, and that's where, you know, 82, um, 8259A comes in, right? So those, that, those are publications to look at foundational cybersecurity activities for IoT device manufacturers. So that's an important piece of it. Um, while there are different uses of IoT, are there something that on the foundation that we should begin to expect that we could see in a range of IoT devices, because if you don't have that foundation, you're not going to have be able to build those security and privacy capabilities on top of them. Um, so that is one way in which we do this work in IoT. Um, we also have things to help enterprises think about the devices. So you have these IoT devices in your devices. Ideally, they're leveraging 8259 or uh, some of the other work we'll talk about today. But if they're not, or if you don't have that ability, how should you as an organization think about IoT? How should it impact the way that you build your enterprise security solutions? And also, are there things you can do on the network? Um, all that then ties into uh, the other part of this, which is the S in NIST standards. Um, we have a role in coordinating international standards on behalf of the entire federal government. Um, we also participate robustly in international standards development. And a lot of the work that we do, given this responsibilities under FISMA for the USG, then becomes that pre-standardization research. And then we can take to international standards bodies and say, hey, is this something we can work on collaboratively with industry to enhance? Um, because this truly is a global issue, as we've already heard. So national approaches to IoT really doesn't make really doesn't make any sense. And to the fullest extent that we can leverage standards to come to the same place internationally with industry and with government, it frees up our ability to focus on the things that matter. Instead of saying, you talk about IoT in this way, we talk about it in that way, what does that mean? It allows us to have more of a common platform to have those discussions. So I think I'm just a little over time. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks again, Shane, for having me. No, that was a very good table setting exercise for a lot of what we're going to talk about. So I really appreciate it. So Dr. Amit Elazari, thank you so much. I believe this is your first IGF USA and I hope you'll be a joiner.
this is this is where discussion happens. Um, so she is the director of cybersecurity policy and government affairs at Intel and a lecturer at UC Berkeley School for the information uh, information master's in cybersecurity program, which I'm glad to hear that exists. She's also a graduate of the Doctor of, of uh, Science of Law. She has a, a JSD from Berkeley Law. So you, supply chain management has been the buzzword for this entire year. And as we talk about all these things towards the end of you know, the decision-making cycle, you guys need to be backed into this way, way early in the process to make sure that you're, you're bringing the tools to the party that people are eventually gonna use to create all this security. So. Tell us about your role in all of this. Absolutely, and I'm so excited to be here with you all and definitely looking forward for more uh, participation in this forum. Um, so, you know, as you heard, this is an ecosystem issue, right? And our role is really foundational. We are enabling uh, the security from the foundations up, from the silicon up in multiple verticals across the ecosystem with supply and to anything from the financial sector to HLS to industrial, specifically with uh, in, in the context of IoT. And of course, we are very much interested in supporting the security and specifically supporting the security based on capabilities, right? For IoT as we are building this foundation. So my role specifically, I'm part of the government relationship uh, team. I'm one of the directors uh, working on global cybersecurity and I focus among, among others on the area of IoT. I work very closely with our engineers in our Internet of Things organizations and with our business partners to bring the goodness and enable the ecosystem. Now, as we work collaboratively on addressing the security um, issues, of course, we need to participate with the ecosystem in many forms. Part of this is the work we're doing uh, with our partners uh, in the IoT Security Alliance. It's standards work. It's enabling the technologies that can help advance our problems, for example, secure device onboarding for our work in FIDO Alliance and the like. But another part of it is, of course, is our active participation in driving best practices in driving international standards and technical conversations uh, as we are talking about today, as well as working collaboratively with our partners, with policymakers and the governments as, of the world uh, as they are considering how to regulate, how to address this issue of IoT security. Now, we know a couple of things about IoT security and the uniqueness of that ecosystem when it comes to security policy. It's a very diverse ecosystem. Again, we are talking in this ecosystem about everything from the potentially cheap consumer IoT device, right, which is low cost, to the sophisticated system of industrial or critical infrastructure systems. We also know that the complexity is not just about the verticalization. It's also about the fact that the IoT ecosystem is touching the uh, the technology supply chain in multiple touch points. So we, everything, we have everything from the cloud connected to this, to the internet governance, to the supply chain, to operational systems and the like. And we also know that the complexity is on the rise because the attack surface itself, of course, is still evolving. So how, we go, how do we go about this with this level of complexity? We have some important principles, right? Security policy principles that are articulated among others in this paper, of course, that the CSDE, my colleague Paul here mentioned that has this broad consensus, but a key pillar of mentioned is to making sure that we have interoperability and harmonization of technical requirements around the world, okay? So we have that backbone of technical specifications that engineers can implement that establish that foundational security footprint. So where do we and I collaborate on that? Of course, we work very closely with our engineers on engaging with NIST and contributing to documents like NIST 8259, uh, A2D, right? And other publications. And we do this across the board, not just for IoT security. We collaborate with our ecosystem partners to create specific standards like the FIDO Alliance Secure Device Onboarding, but we also participate and lead in international standards. Specifically, I'm one of the co-editors of ISO IC 27402, which is our current effort to not just uh, contribute to the work in the US and the work in Europe, but advance globally in ISO IC at SC27, which is our cybersecurity committee um, at that level to promote that international consensus, of course, with global participation and expertise. So we will have that foundation of what are we talking about when we are saying, you know, these are foundational IoT security capabilities, unique authentication, security update and the like. What are the details, both in terms of the device requirements and the process requirements? So again, I'm one of the co-editors leading that work and I'm uh, 
very excited to uh, you know be participating in that with the partners, with our partners, especially our partners here on the line. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate you participating with us today. Our, our last panelist, and definitely not least, because he's the guy who is the one who helps all the things in the boxes get out to everybody who wants them, is uh, Mike Bergman, who's the Vice President for Technology and Standards at the Consumer Technology Association, where he leads the association work on cybersecurity and internet standards. He has been, uh, been in the electronics industry for more than 30 years in memory chip design and wireless communication. So Mike, give us the, give us the, the, the next, layer out, which is the person who actually works with all the people that do the deliverables. All these guys are, are helping you get there, but you know you, you do tr a tremendous amount of work in this space. Thank you, Shane. Um, yeah, so as you indicated in my you know brief bio, I, I've had a career as a working engineer and engineering manager. So I tend to look at all of this, despite being involved with Amit and Paul and, and Adam and his, his team over at NIST, we, we all work together. It, it may sound like we're all ganging up on you all in the in the audience here, but uh, this is a public-private partnership, and you're talking to you know the partners here, some of the partners here. But um, Paul Paul described CSDE, which is a an organization working in a broad sense on best practices, guidance, things like that. Adam described NIST, which has the, the seminal 8259A guidance document. And Amit talked about uh, international standards. Intel is a major player in both cybersecurity within industry and in uh, technical standards uh, to that end. And Amit is a major player on that within Intel. Uh, so now we've got a bunch of these pieces. What I'd like to do is kind of go through how it all sort of fits together and how you can think about it. So if you think about 8259A, it's a best practices or it's a guidance document about the, the, the minimum security capability of, of, a, of an IoT device. When we say minimum, we mean really, you know, guys, you gotta be this tall to ride this ride. That's one of Alan Friedman's uh, favorite sayings about SBOM, if you're familiar with that, but you really need at least this much. And honestly, with IoT, if we could get everybody to comply with just the minimum, that would be great considering uh, the Mori botnet is, is rampaging still and it takes advantage of some of the gaps in just minimum level of security, people not implementing minimums. All right, so 8259A says, look, no minimum, uh, sorry, no default passwords. You've got, a, you've got a variety of guidance in there. It tends to be a little bit more abstract because NIST uh, is aiming at the entirety of the IoT ecosystem with this document, right? But it's it's like, look, just do what we suggest in here somehow, and things are going to be a lot better. Um, I think I speak for my my other two non-NIST panelists in saying we, we really actually believe in that. So separately, as Paul indicated, the C2 consensus came out, and it is a regional, I'm sorry, it's a, an industry or sector specific subset of uh, the, um, the NIST guidance. It's more specific. It doesn't leave anything out. Uh, it's, it's just more specific to a section of the IoT, which is more dominated by consumer electronics. Right? So if you think of this as a cake, the bottom layer might be 8259A, and the next layer might be the C2 consensus. Now those are both guidance. Then we move into technical standards. Uh, Amit and Paul and Adam all use that. I'm going to tell you what I think a technical standard is. A technical standard is a document that an engineer reads and he finds words like shall and must. If you were painting a house and the owner said, I want my house painted. And you said, any color? And the owner said, no, it shall be eggshell blue, right? You don't do it a different way. You do what you do what the shall word says. That's what a technical standard is at root. It's it's a document with enough specificity to tell the engineer exactly what they need to do to be in compliance. The 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 NIST guidance and the C2 guidance move in that direction, and then documents like uh, ISO IEC 27402, which uh, Amit is the uh, the co-editor co for. Uh, and the uh, ANSI CTA 2088, we're throwing a lot of numbers and acronyms at you folks. Uh, but 
The point is, those documents have these shall and must and quantitative requirements that the engineers can understand how to comply with. From there, the next question is, are you doing it? Did you, did you accomplish that goal of meeting those shall and must requirements in the technical standards? And again, this all derives down now from these minimum security requirements, all right? So did you meet the minimum security requirements as instantiated in these technical standards? Well, then we go to conformity assessment programs. There are industry conformity assessment programs that use all the documents we just mentioned, although 27402 is still a draft. So it's not yet brought in, but there's every expectation by all the players that this that it's gonna be a, a very, very important document in this context. But the, the document the, that uh, Europe is using, which is called EN303645. Uh, there's a document that um, the UK's, um, the, the UK government put out uh, called the Code of Practice. Um, there's, uh, there's other documents like this. These conformity assessment programs where you can go out and buy testing for your product actually wrap up these requirements. And so you can go to UL and get tested for compliance to these technical standards. That's called conformity assessment. And you get a certification from UL when you do that. You can um, get the similar service from Eurofins Digital Testing, not as well known a name in the United States, but very well known in Europe. And they do certainly have a US footprint. Uh, Intertech, uh, CTIA has a uh, certification program as well. It's not I'm not as familiar with that one. I'm not going to try to talk too much about it. Uh, but these um, conformity assessment programs then check to see that the product design met the requirements. Now, from these, from this structure, we can talk about policy elements. Right? All of this is engineering, right? And business-to-business -business, uh, discussions. And in fact, before I leave this point, business-to-business -business includes major retailers now looking at these conformity assessment programs because think of your favorite major electronics or consumer goods retailer. Uh, do they want to be on the hook for shipping product that's spied in bedrooms or whatever your nightmare scenario is in cybersecurity? So now we're having a lot of discussions with the retailers in, in our membership I'm with the Consumer Technology Association um, about how all of that is going to work for them. So you take all of that and now you can start making policy decisions. And there is discussion about certification and labeling and all of this. That's all policy. Right now I'm, I'm staying within, for the moment, the structure that's being enabled by all the work of the people on this panel to give you the tools to make policy with. Because without that structure, you, you don't have any target for the policy to, to latch on to. That's, that's more than enough, I think. And Shane, I'm gonna hand it back to you and thank you so much. Uh, you, I, I thought there's some relationship language therapy in there too. It's like, where do you wanna to go to dinner tonight, honey? And you're like, any place as long as it shall be an Italian restaurant. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> you just get it out there so you don't have that fight in the car. Great idea. Um, so you talked a lot about engineers and several of you heard me the, talk about this nightmare meeting I went to on my birthday a couple of years ago at the request of DHS and that there was all lawyers there. And I, it, it, all they could talk about was who they were gonna sue when something hits their system and it's not going to be my device's fault because your network, blah, blah, blah. I was horrified. And I left the meeting and I said, if it's up to you guys, the internet would not exist, nor would any of these things be attached. So like, we're the people that want to help. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about this panel today is the, the ability for all of these players in the ecosystem to get together and then come up with a self-assessment, which basically says, we, you know, we, under, well, actually, I'd like you guys to talk about the self-assessment and how that came about and, and how is that in an area where we're talking about standards and then there's the backing into like best practices and where does this self-assessment come in on that? Yeah, I can, I can address that. That's a great one. Um, so if you think about all of the product that is um, introduced every year in connected products, it's, it's an enormous, enormous tsunami of new products. And that's, I mean, that's the value of innovation. That's, that is innovation uh, right at, right at the, uh, the leading edge. An ecosystem to test everything 
is, is maybe overkill and rather difficult to achieve in a short period of time, like three to five years time frame. What we can also do though, is we can rely on self-attestation or self-assessment. Self-assessment is, I check myself, self-attestation is I assert that I've checked it and I'm asking you to trust me. Now, who would, if I'm a manufacturer, who would trust me? It's someone who can really hold my feet to the fire if I misrepresent that, and that's the major retailers. So if you think about, I mean, think of your favorite major retailer and think of a very large brand name manufacturer. If a large brand name manufacturer self-attests that all of their cameras or washing machines or whatever are in compliance with a technical standard, and we talked about the technical standards, if that manufacturer says these are in compliance and includes that with the purchase order receipt and material and setup sheet and all of that stuff that goes back and forth when you move the product into the retailer, and, and the retailer is willing to accept that, that is, a, that is a very strong market incentive for that to process to work. The, 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 the re- manufacturer has a market incentive to make that work and, and comply with that and not screw up that relationship they have with this major customer. This is also true in terms of uh, any kind of contractual relationship between a, uh, a big buyer and a, a, a vendor. Uh, I will say, I mean, no shade on any category of any manufacturer. We, we love all of our children here at CTA. Mm-hmm. But cybersecurity does require resources and the largest players have shown that they're able to spin up the resources necessary to, to do cybersecurity more quickly than the smaller players. So the if you if you look at the job the major players are doing right now, the largest brands are doing right now, they're doing a much, much better job than say five or 10 years ago. Uh, you will see still, there are still hacks, researchers are still reporting things, but it's when you look under the hood, you see that it's a much better situation. Anyway, self-attestation is about that kind of relationship. And it, it plays a part in a very large uh, ecosystem. We're going to need third-party conformance testing and self-attestation mechanisms to be recognized and valid throughout the process. Because if you simply flip a switch and say, everybody's got to have a UL certification, UL is going to be overwhelmed. Industry is going to be unable to ship product. Customers are going to be unhappy. It's not going to work. It seems like you have found the right balance to be able to collaborate with each other and not be too prescriptive, which I'm always worried about when legislators introduce. And there have been several pieces of legislation that I've had other panels on where we've had, you know, Congressman Markey had a great one where you know he wanted to do this shield. And I tried to explain to his staff, I was like, are we going to be able to scan over it? I don't like, you know, every, because there's software updates and, you know, everything's constantly changing. And so anytime there's a legislative vehicle, you you know, kind of going to your shells and musts, uh, you, you know, like how do we make sure that the end thing is, you know, the, the, the idea for them was consumer, you know, no consumer harm. But I think that the, the balance that you all have struck here is really, you, you know, unique because as we saw from the previous conversation, there's still a group of people that are trying to figure out how to talk to each other. And there's, there's just lots of mischief in the middle space there. And you all from an IoT, you know, have really figured out something that seems to be at least on the path to working. So other comments on the self-assessment? I would just, you know, touch upon something you just raised, which is another principle, which is articulated in the CSDE consensus paper on IoT security policy principle. It's an overarching, by the way, principle for security policy. Um, The IoT ecosystem is certainly one where we are seeing tremendous developments in both technology use case, the complexity of the ecosystem changing at the players ecosystem in the ecosystem, as well as of course the attack surface. Uh, But overarching in security policy, one of the most important principles is design neutrality. The concept of design neutrality when it comes to uh, policy uh, as a whole in technology law, uh, is basically this notion that as we are considering uh, regulations or policies, um, we should try to accommodate uh, terminology that is flexible enough to accommodate for both future technologies. So on the technology side, uh, both future attack surfaces, right? Because the, again, what we're dealing with is also changing, right? And this is very important and a key pillar of many documents you will see across the board. That's where the advantage of technical standards come in because technical standards are amended, certainly 
there are certain bodies that do it uh, much faster than others. Yes, you know, amending some technical specification and standards, especially if that the level of, of uh, international standard uh, could take more time because of the level of rigorous consensus, right? That you have in, uh, for example, ISO IC documents and that takes time, but it's still getting amended, right? With time, with the expertise, with the consensus processes. And that's a little bit of uh, what's the benefit of technical standards. If you wanna go into the detail of the security requirements, that's why you do it in standards as opposed to other policy vehicles. So I just wanted to, not specifically on the self attestation I think you know Mike described a lot of ideas there, specifically on the concept that you raised, which is often termed design neutrality to kind of highlight that. It is a key principle of our work when it comes to IoT security policy. Yeah. I agree fully with everything that Mike said, everything Amit said. The only thing I would also add is that, you know, when people think about self-attestation, they sometimes there's a misconception that there's no enforcement mechanism, whereas there definitely is. Whereas like if you self-attest to something as a company that isn't true, you can get in some pretty serious trouble. So any corporate in-house counsel or anybody looking at these issues will wanna make sure that you're only certifying to things, especially if you're representing a legitimate company, that you're only certifying to things that are factual. And I think that's often not included in these conversations. So you bring up an interesting point. What do you do about the bad actors? What if you get a bad apple in there that that is trying to slide in and that, you know, is there a name and shame part of this? You know, we, we all want to be the good guys and wear the white hat, but what happens when we have the people that are not playing well? So if you're a bad actor in the ecosystem and there's going to be a significant reluctance, if not an outright refusal on behalf of at least some of the more legitimate players in this space to be associated. And in some cases, what you'll see is the government taking some uh, interventions uh, that take the form of policy prescriptions or outright you know, I'm not going to drop names, but you, we've seen situations where the government has taken those steps, which the intelligence community has felt was necessary. Okay. We, we can't actually drop one name. Uh, I, I'll, I'll drop a name. Dahua Technologies. Uh, if you're familiar with the Mirai botnet, then you know that Dahua Technologies had devices that were implicated in that botnet in a very large way. Reports from researchers vary, they use different techniques, but apparently hundreds of thousands of product from that one company was implicated in that. So now you will find Dahua is not on the shelf at your local retailer. Okay, here's a, here's a really, really well-known example, and I'm not, I'm not sharing any secrets here. Uh, I believe they're on the um, entity list now at the, at, um, the Department of Commerce's uh, BIS uh, registry of um, companies where you shall not do business with them. Uh, and uh, they may be also be on the FCC's covered equipment list. It's, it's not a good idea to, to, to ignore cybersecurity. And increasingly, as you know, year after year, we're seeing that it's becoming more and more an issue for everyone in the ecosystem. These bad actors are going to get flushed out pretty quickly. So, Shay, I will uh, address that question, but I'm just going to tweak it to make it just slightly friendlier to say, what do we do with the legacy issues, given that there are plenty of IoT devices out there already uh, that might not have security capabilities built in? Um, and I think, you know, some of the recommendations from, from these various groups, including us, is, is why we end up taking a more holistic view, right? So what are the things we should be doing on the network level and the organizational level? Um, realizing that there are plenty of devices out there now uh, that we have to accommodate, and it's just kind of the reality. Um, so I think there are a lot of exciting things that are happening that allow people to um, sort of assess the health of these devices as they come on the network. And it's that sort of layered approach that I think all of us promote that will help us deal with the fact that the, it's not just about the devices, it's how the devices are being used and um, how they're being managed as well. Uh, so a question, and this goes, well, it, it could be consumer, but it's, I'm thinking more to the industrial level. When you have, um, when you're just the middleman on this, so I'm thinking, Paul, about like some of your membership there, and you start to see something that you think is a potential problem, do you, what, where are you guys on the information sharing perspective of, hey, we're starting to see something come online and we're thinking that this is not, you know, 
if, if you had the ability to, to stop something like a Mirai botnet attack, do you, is that something that there's a capability for now? Or where are we in the, the, the challenges there? So our companies are constantly monitoring the networks for threats, and there are being there are advances that are happening to actually better predict botnet attacks. For example, our member company uh, NTT uh, co-authored a, a paper with NIST earlier this year on uh, models for predicting botnet attacks before they happen, and therefore being able to allocate resources in a way that allows you to respond better. Uh, now. Uh, there, there's also just a capacity issue where if you look at the volume of botnet attacks, they do in many cases get big, bigger, like uh, you have the Mirai botnet that took place in 2016, and that was record setting at the time, but that record has long since been shattered. We're also seeing things like the rise of peer-to-peer -peer command and control architectures in uh, botnets. That's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what this means is that the botnets distribute control among all the nodes on the network, and that makes it a lot harder for the security experts to take these botnets down. So you have, for example, Lumen, their uh, Black Lotus Labs research team, they discovered Mosey. This is a P2P botnet made from the source code of Gafgit, Mirai, which was 2016 attack, and also IoT Reaper. And all of these are known to infect insecure devices that are not built to this industry standards that we're recommending. And Mosey has been quietly assembling an army of routers, DVRs, and other devices that can be used for DDoS attacks, data exfiltration, uh, payload execution. And you see that uh, this is just one example of one company and the research that they're doing uh, to address that particular threat. And very often what you'll see is a company will notice a threat and they will be reactive to the ones that they notice on their networks first. And they share that with other trusted partners in the ecosystem. And this isn't just limited to ISPs. I mean, you see, for example, uh, folks in the IT sector, you see uh, Cisco has a very good research team that uh, they, they share threat information very often with our uh, companies. So this is a whole of ecosystem approach that's needed. And I, I, we are making significant advances. At the same time, the bad guys, they are evolving their threats and tools. Like if the bad guys were just using the tools and techniques that they used back in 2016, we would be on top of that. We would be in a very good position to be able to contain those threats. The problem is just as our tools get better, so do theirs. I also want to quickly build on Paul's point. Mm -hmm. One of the things you would notice if you open up those technical specification documents and the standards, right? Uh, A259, B, D, um, I think both you have uh, potentially even in uh, the C2, of course, but also in uh, 288, uh, references to a concept called vulnerability disclosure programs. So let me explain that. In addition to the capabilities and the importance to work with the ecosystem on what we call cyber threat information, through vehicles like ISACs, through the research that Paul mentioned, where we collaborate with the industry to advance our understanding about threats. There is also an important understanding when it, understanding when it comes to IoT, that the complexity of the landscape and the attacks for surface means we will need to always collaborate with external researchers that are doing the research work, security researchers, and enable that collaboration and transparency that allows external researchers to report vulnerabilities as they find them, right? Unmitigated vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that are not exploited. These are facilitated by programs like vulnerability disclosure programs or the incentivized version is bug bounties. We are very much seeing as part of the trend for IoT security baseline, a focus on that as a capability where organizations are encouraged to have a very clear um, uh, policy that says, if you find something, if you see it, please say something, please report it to this channel. We will work with you collaboratively to facilitate a remediation and mitigation for the vulnerability. And especially when it comes to component, that process of facilitating the remediation, developing the mitigation in a way that is both tested, verified across the ecosystem and increases patch adoption by end users, often term multi-party corner vulnerability disclosure process is one where uh, we collaborate very intensively with the ecosystem across the board. So this is another area where you're seeing companies operating, not just, of course, the importance of cyber threat information sharing, working with the certs of the world, working with the ISACs of the works and our partners, but also facilitating the collab collaboration around the development of the mitigation 
for vulnerability and working together to create a remediation that is actually getting adopted by end users. So I just wanted to add that point because this capability of vulnerability disclosure and handling processes is in fact one that we are seeing a lot of focus on when it comes to IoT security. So uh, that, that brings, I, I'm looking at the, um, uh, the, the questions, and thank you, Mike. Mike's been multitasking and answering the questions in the Q&A as we've been doing it. I really applaud you for that. Uh, but a lot of them are around uh, open source and what we're doing in that space, which also brings to me, so I have a couple, let's start with that one because I also have a question about content delivery networks. But Michael Nelson asks, can the panelists talk a bit about the role of open source software in IoT devices? Libraries of open source software are used by thousands of manufacturers. The code is often very good and tested by great engineers, but bad updates can sneak in and no one is liable if something doesn't work as advertised. What are the key developing and using super secure open source codes? I mean, I saw you smiling and nodding throughout that question. Did you actually have something to say? Otherwise I have something. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, okay. Uh, so here's the thing, uh, Michael brings up a very good point, and it's, a, it's something that we've been concerned about and watching and, and uh, talking to people about for, for some years now. About five years ago, I, I had my first discussions with the uh, OpenWRT people at uh, Purple Foundation about um, what it would take to, um, to make that software more secure. Uh, not because it was a particular problem, but because they had a great community that that uh, was was brought together by the Purple Foundation, and there was a, a strong ability to message to that that community. So this is kind of a supply chain topic, and the hot ticket right now in dealing with the provenance of your software is uh, software build materials, and what's happening is. Um, NTIA is, has been convening an open multi-stakeholder pro, multi process to uh, develop a, a way, not to develop, but to standardize on the methods for itemizing the software components at the very first level in your product. And then when those components integrate something from something else, itemize those. And this reaches all the way into the open source that you pulled in. Now, when you look at a piece of open source, that open source software could be changed from day to day because it's an open process. It could, somebody could have snuck something in. Once you have picked up a piece and you've vetted it and you know that this is the one you're going to use, what you can do is create something called a hash that verifies that this is not changed later on. This hash is a number. It's a cryptographically secure number that represents the exact uh, code that was what you pulled down and vetted and verified. We're not there yet. Software bill materials is, is not quite ready for wide scale across the board ecosystem deployment, in my opinion. It is, it's very close. There's been a lot of great work done by the stakeholder process at NTIA. Alan Friedman is the, uh, is the boss of that. He might be on this call right now. Uh, if, if you are, Alan, you owe me a beer. Um, but um, that's really, I, I think, the, the main uh, ticket across the board industry-wise. There's also secure DevOps processes that are intended to bring a piece of code in, vet it yourself, and then not always rely on something else. Rely on what you, what you know. So those are the two things that I would, I would mention. After the development process is complete, there's also certain types of testing that can go back and look for problems without necessarily knowing exactly what that problem might be. Uh, there's something called fuzz testing, where you just throw data that's randomized in certain specific ways at the, uh, at the system to see if you can get something to react the way it should. I could, I could talk more about that, but probably that's a little too technical for, the, for a general discussion. So, I hope that answers the question. Sure. Uh, I can add two things to that real quick. Uh, first, the, the issue of liability and open source. Well, it is true that in many cases, it's difficult to attach liability to the person or entity that is introducing the update to the open source software. I mean, once, uh, that, once the open source software gets embedded, 
uh, that into another system, insofar that that's an entity that you do have a trusting relationship with, there is an assumption of responsibility in many cases explicitly in contract where there would be a way to hold folks accountable unless you're like, unless you are, uh, take, unless you really don't know who you're doing business with. Uh, but I, I, I wanna also uh, point out, I, I completely agree uh, with uh, Mike Bergman's assessment of the importance of the NTI work around SBOM. Uh, Alan, if you're listening, you owe us two beers and uh, it's two to me. <laughs> yeah. We say party at Alan's house. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> uh, uh, but what I'll say is like while we strongly support what NTI is doing, uh, there there is still a conversation that has to be had about some of the ways that we can uh, continue to evolve this process. And we the recent uh, release of the SBA minimum elements, we're really encouraged that it's going to be iterative and we're continuing to work with them because we think it's so important that uh, what they're doing, we wanna make sure it gets done right. So just to throw more love on Alan, cause it seems like we're having Alan Fest. Uh, he is probably, you had the best use of time while we were all in lockdown and COVID. He has several things that, that he does that explain SBOM on uh, YouTube. So I've interviewed him and I've been very impressed with how well he does it for an average bear. He goes from 101 to 301 very quickly. He has the whole Twinkie analogy he uses, but it's a, it's a great uh, point to bring up how, you know, you need to know what the next layer is, especially when we're going to a software world where, you know, software is eating everything and we need to have a level of trust on that, which I want to comment um Public service announcement here. There's a very healthy chat discussion. If anybody's not watching the chat, and I, I imagine this is archived, so we'll be able to get to it later. But there's a lot of thank you to the panelists as well as other people that are adding uh, pieces in here and are having a whole discussion about this uh, on, on the side. And let's see. Um, oh, so I'm and thank you, Mike. You're doing such a good job of answering all these questions. By the time I want to ask them, you've you've you've, you've completed them. Uh, Felix Ribi is asking, what is the opinion from the panelists about using blockchain to secure IoT infrastructure? Just a bit open, but I'll get, let you take your thought on that. And anybody want to comment? Blockchain. I mean, well, people are thinking, I, I do want to add just a quick thing on the last question um, we, and bring, the, bring us back to what we started with, which is the importance of collaboration and public-private partnership. Um, the SBOM is one example of a consensus driven process that is now going to evaluate as, as part of also the executive order. I think NIST as well is going to contribute to that as part of their development of standards there um, uh, and guidelines under section 4E. And that conversation would continue. And of course, industry is participating very much actively in the conversation at the SBOM, uh, but that's one pillar of security and open source. What's important is we continue to contribute and facilitate those consensus-driven processes and um, understanding, right? Advancing our understanding of what it means to secure open source. And part of what part of what we are doing right there is participating in initiatives like the Open Source Security Foundation, where a, a number of private partners, uh, together uh, with others, are again facilitating these conversations for issues like the S bomb, but also for issues like vulnerability disclosure and other elements and processes that are relevant to secure open source. Very good point. So, I'm sorry, Paul. Were you gonna? Hmm? Uh, no, the focus went to you. Let me, all right. So let me let me try to address the blockchain. Thank you, Amy. That was a great comment. Uh, let me try to address the blockchain item. So first of all, um, there is an interesting um, bunch of technology development about using blockchain to secure IoT. Uh, one of the interesting ways of doing that is to making is has to do with making absolutely sure that the software that you're running on your IoT device really, really, really truly came from the original manufacturer and, and is fully in line exactly what they wanted you to be running. All right, so that's that's great. Yay. Um, but let me let me sort of give you an analogy. I mean, we're talking a little bit more about basic meat and potatoes security. We are not talking about filet mignon with caviar and truffles, okay? So when you have the minimum job taken care of and you start growing in sophistication, Things like blockchain IoT certainly have, have, a, have a very important role, potentially. But in order to get to the point where the incremental benefit of using something like blockchain 
is, is important. When, by the time you, you need that last 3% or 10% or whatever benefit you want to quantify it as, you need to have taken care of a bunch of other stuff first. Now, what we're promoting today, we're talking about today is baseline security. We've used the term, but if you go back and look up what baseline security is in this context, you're going to find AMIT's uh, ISO IEC 27402 spec. You're going to find uh, uh, ANSI CTA 2088. You're going to find NIST 8259A and uh, the CSDE, Paul, Paul spoke about the CSDE C2 consensus. All of those address the minimum baseline that everybody should meet. Even once, even once we get compliance there, broad compliance more or less, we also need better development practices, secure development practices. Ideally, we would start with secure development practices, but when, when things are bleeding, you put a bandage on first. So secure development practices are, are absolutely critically important. Secure development processes that, that instantiate those development practices are very, very critical. So we've got a lot of work to do to bring the ecosystem up to meet this challenge. Blockchain, love it. It's very cool, very interesting stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll, I could say the exact same thing about um, uh, post-quantum encry encryption and using quantum computing uh, in the context of cybersecurity, whether it is uh, for key distribution or for other things. All of these topics are great, but first, we got to get the, the basics taken care of, and that's what we're all, all about right here. So do you feel like we're getting the basics taken care of? Like, where are we on the level of basics being taken care of? Are we on the path? You know what it's are like, it's take, take a whole playground full of children, right? And you tell them, go play soccer. And they've never played soccer before. Let's hypothetically, okay, this isn't a perfect analogy. What we've done so far is we've drawn the field. We've written up the rules and put them on a board. We've got referees going in place. That's the uh, conformity assessment bodies I mentioned. We've got now organizers, that's NIST, that's CSDE. We've got important, well-respected players stepping on the field like Messi uh, uh, or Pele, and that's, that's Intel, right? So we've got all of this going on, and now we need to start recruiting the kids into the game. Interesting analogy. I feel like Amit should have on a jersey right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to whistle. So we're, we have uh, two minutes left. I want to, anybody want to do a last round of thoughts that where we're headed, um, where you want to leave this group with this discussion? Paul, I'll start with you. You look like you have words coming out of your mouth. All right. Well, I was just thinking like, obviously it's going to be important for government and industry to continue to rely on each other as partners. We're also going to need to continue driving towards an international standard and do our best to mitigate regional fragmentation. But finally, we're going to need smart policies that make it easier to deploy securely designed products in countries across the globe. Because, you know, you, you got to keep thinking this is not just a U.S. problem. So you need to raise the expectations for security no matter where you live, no matter what language you speak. Uh, I've said before, cybersecurity has no borders and we're going to need global solutions. There. Adam, as he's kind of put you in that with governments being important, you're a big and important government guy. <laughs> something, something like that. Um, yeah, no, I was going to, um, so I, I really appreciate the question and I think Mike addressed it well in the chat about cloud. And I think uh, I would sort of echo that that's an important thing to consider. Another thing, but another thing we didn't really talk about very much today is privacy. And I think, um, and a lot of the, the, the facts that Mike brings up about the challenges with engineering good security are like 20 fold when it comes time for privacy. Um, and particularly with IoT devices, you're going to have a lot of unique privacy needs that are very different than the security capabilities. So that was something I would kind of put a pin on and say, let's try to come back to that and talk about work we can do to, to get, you know, true privacy engineering practices pushed forward. I mean, we do work in that space, but it's something I think we need to do um, a lot more around and, and on. Um, and I would agree that this is, you know, this is something that, um, regardless of what paths any sort of policies take, there will be a basis and there will be a necessary basis of strong public-private coordination or call it private-public coordination, depending on uh, the types of issues we're trying to address. So thanks. Yes. I mean, final thoughts? Yeah, my final thoughts are, I mean, security is not a one-stop 
uh, it takes all of this, right? And this is what we're seeing. Um, and if security is, of course, top of mind, that it's a critical issue and a priority when it comes to IoT and technology across the board, then we need to recognize it's not just about the technology. In the technology, it's not just about our, you know, best assurance, SDL processes, leading quantum vulnerability disclosure processes. It's also the foundational security in the hardware, in the software across the board. That's on the technology side, but it's also about the partnership. And the partnership is everything from enabling the ecosystem through your technologies, but also that active participation, that collaborations through alliances, so work on, through work on technical standards and advancing our shared understanding all the way to participation with governments, with policymakers in those public-private uh, partnerships. And it's also collaboration and partnership with the security research community as they work and you know uncover uh, uh, the vulnerabilities and the issues of the future. So for me, the real takeaway from this discussion is the importance of collaboration, the importance of uh, flexibility and working together on all these documents as we are trying to tackle uh, the emerging attack surface. Yeah, a lot there. Mike, final thoughts? I'll be very quick um, because we're, we're at time. Uh, I want to thank Shane. Great job and, and my fellow panelists and just say to anyone out there who's got policy somewhere in your job. What we've described today is a framework that starts with a, a government agency and their fundamental document works through levels of sophistication or refinement or different parts of the chain, all the way out to verification by third parties and uh, self-attestation is verified by business to business relationships. All of this should be watched very carefully by anybody who's thinking about policy on cybersecurity for IoT in Washington, and, and quite frankly, internationally, because it's, it's a complete soup to nuts picture. And we've got now, as agencies consider uh, IoT security in their own context, uh, you know, what's the relationship of cybersecurity for product safety for CPSC, for example, other agencies I could mention also. So as agencies and other regulators, as um, legislators, consider IoT cybersecurity, please, please, please look at what's being built. Don't start from scratch. Don't try to do something in parallel. Don't go to some outside organization. This is industry and government working together. It works. Take a look at it. Try to see if you can hitch onto this train. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of the panelists, not only for today, but for all the work you have done and all the work I know you're going to continue to do. So as somebody who loves all my devices, and I have lots of them in my house, but also understand that we have so much more coming online. Um, the work you're doing is amazing. So keep it up. And uh, Dustin, back to you. <laughs>